Good morning, squad. Man, what a weekend it has been. It's your boy Ruck in the building, man. Obviously, today we're diving into all things spring football practice. However, part two of this segment of the show today will actually be joined by Aaron Korn from Stat Chat Sports. We're going to talk all things Tennessee basketball. We're going to recap the season. Uh, obviously, Tennessee takes the L on Thursday night to Florida Atlantic University, who is now heading to the Final Four. Um, did we get out coached? Did we get out played? I don't know. But we're obviously going to talk about the entire year from start to finish, the flow of the year. What were the highs? What were the lows? I think that this year was a year of high and lows for this Tennessee basketball team. And me and my man Aaron Corm are going to dive in and talk all things uh, and recap that season, man. But today, man, first segment, we're diving into the Tennessee football spring practice season. The week first week is done today. We start a brand new day. Obviously, everybody got to have Sunday off. Um, but on Monday, man, we're back at it. And so I'm just going to recap the week a little bit. Uh, Joey Hosley, uh, goodness, Jordan Matthews, Nico, Joe, uh, Nathan Laycott, uh, Rodney Garner spoke to the media on Saturday. There's just a lot of things to decompress and talk about as we head into the last couple weeks of spring football practice, man. It's just a big show today. I'm locked in. Stay tuned in with me today, man. It's going to be a banger show. You already know what to do, baby. Like, comment, subscribe. But you already know what it is. It's straight up Tennessee, baby. This is the Monday Rundown. Let's go. Good morning, squad. It's a big show today, man. It's your boy Ruck in the building, man. It is straight up Tennessee on the Monday rundown. We diving in today, family. Uh, Tennessee football spring practice launched last Monday. Uh, we start week two today, man. I'm just looking forward to continue to hearing about the improvement of the defensive side, the offensive side, just improving as a team as a whole. Um, it's a new era, obviously. Uh, Hendon Hooker's gone, Jalen Hyatt. A lot of these guys that we've been uh, leaning on the last couple years, they're gone. And how does this team reset and refocus and reshift the way uh, we do a couple of things? I don't think a lot will change, but it's a lot to look forward to. So, uh, man, we're getting ready to dive into all things Tennessee football. But first, you already know what to do, man. Like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell notification if you're rocking with us on YouTube. For our families over at Apple Podcasts and Spotify, thank you, man, for listening. I mean, review this thing. Continue to rate it five stars. It just helps us grow. It helps the algorithms. It, it, I don't know why, but it does. So go ahead and do it, man. We're on our way to 550 subscribers here on YouTube. And... Uh, getting more and more downloads as we speak. So thank you guys so much for your love and support. Share this thing. You know what to do, man. Go ahead and share it out and uh, get it in the hands of the people that need it most, man. If they need anything, all things Tennessee, from the balls to the Grizzlies, you already know what it is. It's straight up Tennessee. They be your boy Ruck in the building, man. Like I said earlier in part two of the show today, we'll be joined by Aaron Corm from Stat Chat Sports, man, a guy who is in love with the game of basketball and, um, Obviously, with Tennessee going down on Thursday, there's a lot of things to kind of digest with this season. Um, like I said earlier, was it was it success? You know, is this our ceiling with Rick Barnes? Do do we actually think that he can get us over the hump with these new recruits? And you know, I don't have the words. I don't have the answers. Um, but Aaron and I are going to chop it up for a minute and just see kind of what we're thinking, man. Like, is there. Is there a way that Rick Barnes can get over the hump in these next couple years? So uh, thank you all, man, for rocking with us today, man. Tennessee, again, like I said, spring practice started last week. A lot of the coaches and uh, a lot of the young guys actually got the opportunity to meet with the coaching staff. The, or, sorry, to meet with the media. I thought that was incredible. And, uh, you know, I really want to talk about what happened on, um, I think it was Wednesday or Tuesday when the young guys um, and that, that group of guys was um, – Sorry, you had Nathan Laycock, 
you had Jordan Matthews, you had Nico Iamaliava, uh, Joey Hosley talked to with the media that day. Joe Milton talked with the media that day. Um, just a massive day for, I think, these young guys to get in front of the media, have some face time, but also begin to uh, show us a little bit of their personality. Um, one guy that I'm really excited about, and I was excited about him before hearing his interview, was Jordan Matthews. He just seems like a dog. You know, like when you run across a kid, man, in high school and man of many words or a man of few words, but just a man of swag. That's what Jordan Matthews presented in his media appearance on Tuesday. And I think that is just the Louisiana boy in him. You know what I mean? Like um, Louisiana tough nose, hard, hard headed, uh, just vicious football players. And I felt that from him. In his uh, media appearance on Tuesday, I felt as if he was very confident in getting on the field. You know, there were many questions asked to all of these guys. You know, what do you need to do to hopefully get that opportunity come fall um, to see the field? And a lot of the responses um, were the same, which I don't know if I credit that to the position coaches or if I credit that to Josh Heupel just instilling the posture of learning to these guys, but they all responded with the same thing. It's like, Hey, it's spring. You know, nothing is solidified in spring. There's no starting position solidified, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, we're going to really start nailing that down come fall right now. I'm just learning right now. I'm just learning, blah, 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 blah. So it's like, they all said the same thing, you know? Um, and I just think Jordan Matthews could be massive for our defensive back end. I mean, gosh, he could play safety. He could play star, I'm um, very physical. He's not massive. I think right now he's weighing in at like 185. He's not big, um, <clears throat> but he reminds me of Jensen Jackson. I don't know if any of you guys remember back in the early 2010, 2015 era. Um, Derek Dooley was the coach, I believe, and Jensen Jackson was a safety who unfortunately got kicked off the team for some things outside of the football program, but he would have been – in my mind, the next Eric Berry, fast, athletic, wasn't a big guy, but was so physical. And uh, seems like that's what Jordan Matthews is going to bring to the table as well. Um, offensive coordinator Joey Hosley met with the media as well. And um, the thing that I loved about his interview with the media was they had asked him, you know, what is the thing you're looking for right now from the offense, specifically from the quarterback quarterback position? And he said, I've got one message for my quarterbacks, and that's let it rip. He 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 just kept saying, like, we can't hold back right now. Like, we got to make mistakes. Like, we don't want mistakes, but mistakes are expected. You know what I'm saying? And he said it, it just makes it makes it a little more interesting that. With Joe, obviously, you know, we, we've been prone to see a guy who gets amped up, overthrows the football a little bit and makes some mistakes. But to be told, let it rip, lets me know that there's full confidence, not just in Joe Milton, but in Nico Yamaliava, Gaston Moore, Navy Shuler, like all of these guys in that quarterback room. And gosh, we know we know Gaston Moore and Navy Shuler will probably never see the field at Tennessee. But the message to them all is let it rip. And um, I think obviously you got Joe Milton entering in his third year in this in this system. You got Nico coming in as a freshman. And there's some disconnect, obviously, because Joe is a system like he, he knows the system like the back of his hand. Nico, very young, raw, green, but has talent, obviously. Um, so we've got two guys right now, one that hasn't really proven himself in Joe. Uh, we've seen a lot of Joe Milton. We've seen what he can do and we know what he can do, but he still hasn't proven um, that he is necessarily capable of consistency. Right. Um, and then you got a young guy, Nico Iamaliava that you just don't trust yet. And I don't care of how talented you are. I, I, we just can't trust you yet, you know? And uh, one thing that Coach Hosley said was he's talking about Joe Milton. He's like, man, Joe Milton can go to whatever level he wants to. Um, he, he's like he's he actually was talking about last season. And when you think about the Orange Bowl, that was really Joe Milton's fourth start as a Tennessee Vols quarterback. Think about it. Joe Milton started the Bowling Green game in 2022, 2021. Sorry. 
Then he started the Pittsburgh game, got injured, didn't start again the rest of the year, then started against Vanderbilt and then the Orange Bowl <laughs> against the Clemson Tigers. So Joe still has a lot of growing to do when it comes to the flow of the game. We've only seen him fully start four games, people. Really, he's only played three and a half as the starter at Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? So we have to kind of process that in that realm of Joe hasn't done um, a lot of a, a huge body of work, but we know that he can and we know that he has the opportunity right here in front of him to uh, succeed and, and really be as good as he wants to be. Um, also, another thing that Coach Hosley said um, about Joe was he was like, you know, and I said this a little bit earlier, but I kind of want to digest this. He said, go make mistakes like we have to make mistakes um, in order for us to succeed and learn from them. Like we can't be perfect in every little thing, right? We have to know that in the flow of the game, there's going to be mistakes. If we throw an interception, let's let it happen, right? But let's bounce back. Let's, let's snap and clear, man. We got to snap and clear. We can't be in this posture of, well, uh, I hope we don't do that again. No, it's snap and clear. It's like, let's snap the ball. Let's go. Um but I think with Joe Milton back there, obviously there's a level of comfort um, because he's been playing football in college, and this is now his fifth year, um, and it's time for him to make some noise. So I'm very excited to see about him. Um, obviously, there was another thing that was really cool. Uh, if y'all haven't been following the Vol Club Confidential podcast with Austin Price, um, he has been having a lot of the big big names, um, whether it's transfers or whether it's guys that we just come to know, Brew McCoy, Jalen Hyatt, you name it. He's he's basically started this podcast with the Tennessee Fund. <laughs> well, he just had Keenan Peely and Gabe Judy Lolly. From the two BYU transfers, he just had them on the podcast this past week. And, man, it was just incredible hearing their story, hearing their why behind why did they come to Tennessee and how in the world did they get here together, both from BYU. You know, Keenan Pali talked about how he spent all five of his years, right, at BYU. Obviously, he had an injury, um, which allotted him this sixth year, and he decides to transfer to Tennessee. Gabe Julie Lolly starts his his uh, his college career at Vanderbilt, just two and a half hours up the road from Knoxville. Um, plays there two years, transfers to BYU. He still has two years because of the COVID year, but in the podcast, he literally mentions, you know, I I know that I have two years, but I I wanted to pick my transfer destination based off of thinking that I only have one. And he felt as if Tennessee was the place for that. If you've never, if you don't think about that, you're like, oh, that's just awesome. You know, you feel like you can be here and you make a difference. But what I heard was, oh, I'm playing now and I'm about to go crazy. Right. Like I heard Willie Martinez and Tim Banks have entrusted Gabe possibly with a starting role this year, which y'all, y'all know we need corners. <laughs> Y'all know we need corners, man. We need corners that can actually play corner. We don't need athletes. We need corners. Yes, they need to be athletic, fast, all of that. But, like, we need people that know in, in their head, all right, man, I got I got a stack right here in front of me. My safety's got to help over. I need my safety, not my linebacker, because I'm in a double stack formation right here on the wide side of the field. All right, if this guy goes here, I'm playing cover two, right? If we're playing a zone, let's say we're not in man. I got to know that my safety got help over the top, but I can't, I have to, I have to have this guy for 10 yards. You know what I'm saying? Like I got to keep up with him for 10 yards. So it's just those things. I feel like Gabe Julie Lolly is going to bring that experience in the mind um, that we've not had <laughs> in that back, in that back end for some time. But uh, Rodney Garner, man, lastly, uh, obviously I just mentioned a lot of the guys that have met with the media, but Rodney Garner, met with the media on Saturday and he's saying that he wants more, more growth from this uh, defensive front. I think we have one of the most um, veteran defensive lines in the sec, probably in the country. Um, but obviously there's a lot of energy and excitement around Tyree West, Josh Joseph, James Pierce. Um, the Herring brothers are now both at Tennessee. Um, they play linebacker, but there's just a lot of excitement from these young guys. Right. But you still got Omari Thomas. You still got Roman Harrison who came back. You still got uh, uh, the Bulldog, Elijah Simmons. Like, you still have guys 
that have been on this roster for some time who haven't uh what's the word they, they haven't peaked yet right big O, great year last year and then there's just a couple of games where you're like he was non-existent if he wants to be successful at the next level like he has to be a derail type a derail taylor a matthew butler like where you dominate i don't matter who you're playing and we haven't seen that from big O. we haven't and i think he has to do that this year if he wants to play uh at the next level but um one thing that was very intriguing to me was in, in the interview with the media, Rodney Garner actually said he was satisfied with the first week of practice. You know, he's like, I think the dudes are working hard. You know, they're taking the coaching. And if y'all don't know, man, Coach G coaches you hard. Uh, every every defensive lineman that has come through Tennessee the last two years has said, man, Coach G gets the best out of you, which means he's not the easiest guy in in a coaching situ in a coaching scenario he's not the easiest guy to maybe even get along with but he pushes you because he knows there's so much purpose and and passion in this person in this individual to push them to the next level and so but coach G says he he's like I know they're working hard they're taking the coaching their attention to detail has been great um but specifically Saturday he said it was a little uh underwhelming you know and it's just said they felt tired. And I think that that's adversity, right? I think in games, we face that. Um, think about Alabama. We face adversity, but fought back enough to, to get back to win that game. Um, you know, another thing Coach G said that I really did love was he said, we have to find a way to strain and tough it out. I think that is the thing that this defensive line has been marked by since Rodney Garner and the Josh Heupel system, uh, Tim Banks, all of them have come to Tennessee. It's the fact that even if we're down, even if we're exhausted, these guys still fight. And I think these young guys, the Tyree West of the world, James, Joshua Josephs, they have to be a part of that culture that helps fight. And once they do, this team is 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 going to be uh, kind of scary. So uh, week two started today, obviously, and uh, we're just ready, ready, really excited to see kind of the flow of what happens over the next couple of weeks. Orange or white game is on the 15th of April. Um, I think they've had five practices, so they have 10 left. Um, I think that's right. Um, but. Excited to see some more news and more updates from this week. Uh, obviously, we're going to cover it, man. Tennessee basketball is over, um, but we're going to cover all things spring and just kind of get this thing ramped up. Recruiting, huge recruiting weekend this past weekend. A lot of five-star, four-star guys. Uh, actually, a Florida running back commit was smiling ear to ear when asked about the pot potential of Tennessee, of a Tennessee flip. He smiles and says no comment. So, uh Tennessee is just a place to be. It's, it's really that simple. So, uh, But, yeah, man, we're getting ready to cover this Tennessee basketball season. Uh, man, I, as much as I want to talk about this, I don't want to talk about it. But we'll be joined here in just a second by Aaron Corm from Stat Chat Sports as we dive into all things Tennessee basketball now. Um, how was the season? Does Rick Barnes need to stay? What's the ceiling? How, how are we feeling? Uh, all of that and more coming up in part two of the monday rundown but first we got to thank our sponsor in whitehead auto sales man whitehead auto sales serves the blunt county community so well they're right off south hall road right there in alcoa if you need a used car and i'm talking about a used car that is in pristine condition take well taken care of and you want to work with people who treat you like family whitehead auto sales is the place to be you don't believe me man just hit them up at whiteheadautosales.com get pre-approved on their website so that when you go to the car lot it's just easy yeah, I mean, it's just way easier. Um, they can get you pre-approved with, with a credit score of 580. I promise. Um, we have vehicles from them. Our credit score ain't 580, but they can do it. I've seen it happen. But we have vehicles from them, people in my family, people I know. Um, it's just the best car buying experience I've ever experienced. So hit up whiteheadautosales.com, ask for Andy or Nick, and they will take care of you. We'll be right back with Aaron Korn from Stat Chat Sports as we dive into the 2022 23 Tennessee men's basketball season. It's straight up Tennessee, baby. Let's go. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to part two of the Monday rundown. Like I said, man, I'm joined here with uh Mr. Bracket Challenge winner. Uh 
<laughs> Aaron Corn from Stat Chat Sports, man. What's goody, my boy? I'm just impressed with the name selection there. <laughs> <laughs> looks good. It looks good. It looks good. Mr. Bracket Challenge winner himself. Uh, if y'all don't remember, um, right before March Madness started, myself, C2, Aaron, and Turner filled out a bracket. <clears throat> Aaron, uh, I think you had what? The, the West? South? East bracket? I don't remember. Big West. West, West, the, West. The West bracket. And <clears throat> yeah, he's clearly. Uh, I don't think anybody is is close to <laughs> how many W's he picked in that side of the bracket. So dinner on me for Aaron, but I told him the catch is he's got to get to Nashville. They got a Ruth Chris in Nashville? They do. <laughs> but there's way better steakhouses than Ruth Chris. You go in Ruth Chris, you get a baked potato for 50. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't nobody <laughs> spending that, boy. <laughs> hey, you want baked potato? Fifty dollar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but man, glad to have you, Brody. Uh, man, man mm-hmm. best friends, man. So, <clears throat> but obviously, man, we talked all things football. Segment one. Here we are in segment two, wrapping up the Monday rundown. Really, just diving into this. I don't even have like the the correct description. Like it was like <clears throat> a successfully poor season (laughs) like like the best way i can think of it is there were moments where you were like oh my gosh like this team can be legit and then there were a lot of moments where the scoring droughts and the terrible losses to really bad teams and then you turn around and you beat teams like alabama and texas and arkansas and 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 you beat these teams handily like you don't just (laughs) Oh, we won by buzzer. No, no, no. Like you win by 10 plus, but then you lose to Florida and Kentucky twice. I mean, and a Kentucky has a down year. You use you lose to an FAU team who honestly may be a little bit better than we thought they were heading to the final four. Um, I don't know, man. It it was just like the most successfully (laughs) down year of the Vols. And, you know, my first question for you is. What did you ex- – like, when you looked at the team, you hear about the exhibition game. They beat Gonzaga by 20. They mm-hmm. they lose to Michigan State by a buzzer beater in the exhibition, and you're like, oh, my gosh, like, this team is about to be for real. Like, at that moment earlier this season, like, what was what did you think about this team? Yeah, I mean, you think they're going to be what they showed you, and then obviously it progressed, but – I don't know, dude. That team just – I said this the other day. They they were like one of the weirdest teams. They did not have an identity all year. I, except like the first of the year, it seemed like it was all defense. And then I, I feel like it was around when conference play started. They quit playing defense. Mm-hmm. It might have been a little earlier or a little later than that, but then they just started trying to score, and they can't score, and they quit playing defense. And it carried on really – it didn't carry on into the tournament. They're just so weird, dude. They don't have an identity. Like, they played defense against Duke, and then they didn't play defense against FAU. It was just like – it was every other game. It was like they were a completely different team. Like, they had a different scheme every time they touched the court. (laughs) Like, I would say this. General consensus of the team was Tennessee was built off of their defensive play, which Mm -hmm. you you see – hold FAU to minus I think it was 12 of their season average they scored 62 on us they averaged 74 so it's like but when you watch the flow of the game you're like yeah Tennessee still held them under but it felt like they scored every possession (laughs) but you know it's even this bro imagine if you hit they had in the first half I counted they they shot 14 threes of the in the first half they were three of 14 eight of those eight of them were wide open misses right that's 24 points like tennessee could have got blew out literally oh yeah yeah and then when you think about and so it's just (laughs) that was all year man i felt like the scoring droughts and but can i say this and i'm gonna say this now i'm gonna get this out here early that is based off of coach barnes can't help you shoot and score I'm sorry. Like, if you're missing, 
That's your, that's on you. Guys are wide open. Tyreek Key, floater, brick, jumper, brick. Julian Phillips, most underwhelming five star since Robert Hubs. Like, <laughs> like, 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 my thing is this, bro. And I'm going back and I'm saying this at the top of this segment because I think it's very important. We were not having these conversations four years ago when we had Bowden, Bone, Grant, Admiral. There were no scoring slumps. Then we had no paint presence. We had Kyle Alexander. Yeah, he was all right, but at the at, we had a we had a paint a paint uh, a, a paint presence with Grant scoring the basketball, but he was an undersized four. <clears throat> so, like when we were playing bigger teams, they would out. I mean, they would they would hoop on us, and that was our downfall then. But we never had scoring droughts. I mean, that team was averaging 70, 75 points a game. And at any given <clears> moment, you knew it was going to be one of four people that was going to get – that was going to have 20. It was going to be Sko. It was going to be Grant. It was going to be Bowden or Bone. One of them was going to have 20. Like, you knew that. This season, mm -hmm. really, really since they left, we haven't had that. No. Why do you think that is, though? I mean, think about it. Is it just we don't, personnel I, or what? I don't, bro. The thing is, that team had zero <laughs> five stars on it. Think about it. Jordan Bone, who is probably the best Tennessee point guard in the last ten years, he he was a he was a three star and barely made it to be a three off of his last camp. That was like a a month before he came to Tennessee. So it's mm -hmm. like. <clears throat> Jordan, ba Jordan Bowden, we, I mean, bro, Jordy Bow, shout out to you, Brody. Like, we played high school against this dude. Like, I can vividly remember playing against Jordan. Like, he can shoot, that's it. And he goes to a prep school for a year and his whole game changes. And he gets to a level now where he's eating in the G <clears throat> League. He needs to be on somebody's roster. I don't know why he ain't on, <laughs> on the roster. And. Yep. But he had those spurts at Tennessee. Like, he'd have a couple games where you'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then he'd go for 20, and you're like, there he is. Mm -hmm. And he, obviously, Grant and Admiral, they were development pro products. And through the system, through the coaching, um, you know, I'm going to say this, and here's why I, I truly think. There's a guy that was on those teams who is now a head coach at Georgia State named Rob Lanier. He was an assistant coach for all of those years. The first five years that Barnes was at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Go look at Georgia State's numbers. They score crazy points. He, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was running the offense. Like, and he recruited based off of the scoring strength, whereas Barnes tends to recruit defensively. And we've been great defensively. Like, I, I mean, I can't complain, but – you got to score points to win in this league, bro. Like the SEC is no joke anymore. Like it's call, call me crazy. SEC is the is the second best conference in in NCAA in basketball now. You know, them boys don't want to go out there and just focus on defense. <laughs> but they can't score. That's what's weird, dude. I don't know. I mean, nobody knows what they do in practice. Like we don't have a behind the scenes informationalist but like i mean these kids probably average 20 to 25 in high school and it's like they come here and they score eight like i don't i don't know if he just turns these like if there are scoring guards that come here and then he's just so laser focused on getting them to focus on defense that they lose their like offensive identity in college like i know college they might just run sets and stuff but like there's still plenty of guys out here that can go and get a bucket, but right. it, I mean, yeah, obviously they didn't have that this year. Do, but. do you think this, <clears throat> think about those teams, Bowden's, the Bones, the Shimbari Phillips, like think about these teams, right? They were way more athletic than we have been the last three years. And <clears throat> I got back to that with this freshman class that none of them played except Julian Phillips and BJ Edwards, uh, Freddie Delone, the, the uh, DJ, DJ Jefferson, who's going to play next year. Like, I think that the athleticism is where we have been lacking the last three years necessarily. Right. Like think about the COVID year, right? 
Keon Johnson was the only athletic guy on the floor. But you saw it because he's shooting jumpers, and when he sh- jumps to shoot a jumper, his 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 nuts are in your face because he's jumping so high, right? Like <clears throat> Jaden Springer was fundamental; like he wasn't athletic, but Kennedy Chandler was was athletic. He was a he was, but it's like we need a team full of them again, mm-hmm. and we haven't had that in three years. Yeah. But then it comes to the point where you've had the same coach who's had that talent and he can't get past that hump, dude. And you know there's people out there that don't want him around anymore. <laughs> who's better? And who 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 I don't know. That's the that, I think that's it's the like thing. it's so weird. It's cause it's like you know what you get with him. It really just comes down to like what you what your satisfactory level is like with the program because you know what you're going to get and people are like man he's lost all these games they should have made it to the final four by now i personally i personally don't think he ever will if he hasn't done it by now i don't think he'll do it but i don't know it's just like who are you going to get out there realistically that i mean you you fire him right now Number one, you don't know who you're going to get. Two, you don't know if they're even going to get to where he's gotten you. And then, I mean, you're looking at – I don't think basketball setbacks are as bad as football as far as rebuilds. I think basketball you can do two to three years. Football is usually three to five (laughs) or you're done. In Tennessee's case, it was (laughs) ten. But I don't know, dude. I don't don't know who else they would get, but – I'm, I see both sides of it. I'm kind of on the fence because, you know, I don't – I mean, I'm kind of unbiased. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you think. I don't know if you're satisfied with here's what the, the dude does. I don't know. Here's the question. <clears throat> Is – and it's really a comment and a question. Mm-hmm. When Rick Barnes was fired from Texas eight years ago, it took Texas till now to rebuild. Do yeah. ten- can Tennessee fans do that again? No, no, we no. have not patient <laughs> enough for that, right? Eight years, there's no <clears throat> way. Like it literally took Texas till this year to be like, oh, like we're 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 really back again. And um, obviously, it took a lot of coaching changes. Chris Beard hadn't been there that long. Like I think that he was in year two then gets messed up with his DUI and all whatever was happening there. But then the guy (laughs) steps in who was on Rick Barnes' staff when he coached at Texas, and now he's about to lead him to a Final Four. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like protégés of Rick Barnes have excelled, but what is it that he can't himself get over the hump? Like, I I just don't know what it is. I don't either. I don't know if it's his style or what. I really don't know. I mean, you got to think, this man coaches guys like P.J. Tucker, T.J. Ford, Kevin Durant. Like, he ain't had just, ah, these are okay guys. No, these dudes were like vets in the league, million-dollar man. Kevin Durant still in the league getting – he's still probably the best scorer of my generation. Like, and he coached this man. So it's like, I don't know if we can say that – we can't justify firing Rick Barnes. It doesn't make sense. But at the same time, is there a guy on this staff now that he's just kind of pruning to – I mean, let's say Rick Barnes is, what, 67, 68? Like, he's not young. So he's going to be done in two to five years anyways. So it's like, do you do you just hold on <laughs> for baby. a <laughs> – That boy might keep going. <laughs> he, might. he might, but – Okay, let me ask you this, bro. <clears throat> I have obviously we said this earlier. You look at the progression of the year. You start at Gonzaga winning by twenty, then you you lose to Michigan State in the exhibition, and then you go on a, a nice little start to the season. You you start two and zero. Oh, you lose your third game to Colorado, super random loss. Who they didn't even make the NIT. Horrible team, but that was the first game Tennessee had a poor shooting slump. Everybody's worried. I'm like, hey. Yay, I'm glad we lost early. 
Because mm-hmm. after that, guess what? Tennessee didn't lose again till January 14th. Well, actually, I'm lying. They didn't lose again till December. Oh, God. It was against our Arizona. We went to Arizona and lost 75 70. So Tennessee won 12 straight. So they were 12 and three. They go to Arizona, they're 12 and four. Come back from Christmas, conference play starts. And that is when I felt like we just melted. Mm hmm. And you lose to Kentucky at home to Kentucky team that was terrible. Like when I say terrible, like I, they were still like out of everybody in the country, Kentucky's still a top 25 team. But they just when I think of Kentucky, like this was not a Kentucky team. Right. Like they they were just a bunch of dudes out there wearing Kentucky and just didn't play very well. But. I felt like the turning point was after that Kentucky loss. It just – that was the first loss at home in 29 games. It just yeah. – just yeah. it did something to the team. And it carried throughout the rest of the season. You lose to Kentucky. Then you lose to Missouri. Then you lose to Florida. Then you lose to Texas A&M. Then you lose to Kentucky again. And then you lose to Vanderbilt. And then Missouri. <laughs> and it's like, what? What? Right. They did not have an identity. I told somebody that team reminds me of <laughs> that dude on Split. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. you don't you don't know what you're gonna get, dude. Like they would come out and hold a team to 48, and then the next game they come out and like they'll try to match you bucket for bucket, and they can't do that. That the like they just didn't. It was so weird, dude. It makes you think it's coaching, like. I mean, even the last game was just the end game. The end game stuff was just not not it, bro. Like, you're playing a team that's smaller than you and your best rebounder's on the bench the whole game. You're playing a team that shoots a lot of threes and you switch to a 2-3 zone to prove that you're going to get lit up and then go back to man. <laughs> like, what? That's I didn't, dumb. I didn't understand anything they did really that whole game. You know – and BJ Talking should have been playing before this game to get him ready for something like that. Because, I mean, just like football, dude, like you want your backup QB ready to roll. He's they, got didn't, to be. they don't have a backup point guard ready to play. They played him for – I saw the kid touch the court one time all year. He might have played here and there, but yeah, I never saw him getting any type of reps or anything. But mm-hmm. I don't know. So, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if he transfers. No, it was weird, though, dude. The season was weird because it was like the end of the season. Because you're slightly impressed because you made it that far without a point guard. Every other team that's still playing has a point guard. Yeah. But then it's just like, yeah, that was great, but you just lost a game you definitely shouldn't have lost. You can't really justify losing that game, in my opinion. Mm -mm. But that's why it's so weird. And it was like that. That was the theme all year. It's like just up and down dude like you're impressed at some points and then you're just like what the hell are y'all doing like the very next game (laughs) yeah yeah you know thinking about the fau game i knew when fau and here's what was crazy how did i know this but i just knew because we can't tennessee can't score the basketball but seven minutes left in the game fau goes up 10 and i'm like we lost we lost because we did not have enough firepower to – like, they went up 10 points, bro. <clears throat> 10 points is nothing. Like, dude, we can shave 10 points in three minutes, but mm-hmm. not this team. Like, no, this but, team could not do it. Come back. <laughs> and so, with down 10 with seven left, I was like, it's over. Like, we lost. I go to bed that night. <laughs> I, I Like, the game wasn't over, but I was like, it's over. Like, I knew it was – I knew we lost. I go to bed you- that night. <laughs> You know when it's over. Jack was uh, – my wife was asleep. I lay down. Like, I didn't say a word. She turns – like, she. I just lay down. She turns over. She said, what happened? I said, we lost. I said, I mean, it ain't over, but we lost. <laughs> it's over. Yeah. It's I over. said, we lost. I mean, the game ain't over, but we lost. <laughs> and so, man. Yeah, but – It was over. Like, wrapping up segment two, wrapping up the Monday rundown right now, man. Like, I mean, I'm trying to think of the way to say this. Looking at the roster next year with DJ <laughs> Jefferson, he redshirted this year. Hopefully, a BJ Edwards sticks around. 
Um, obviously, there's no way Julian Phillips is going anywhere. Um, BJ Edwards, Freddie DeLong, the North Carolina guy who came over um, and and, <coughs> and uh, enrolled early but couldn't play. Um, so he'll be considered, I guess, a redshirt freshman this coming year. With the athletic ability of this team, hope and, and I think this depends too because I think all of them except one person can come back. And what I mean is like Josiah and San, Santi, all of them, I think they all need to leave. Like just leave. Don't come back, please. <laughs> but they all have another year, everybody except Euros. Um because of the COVID year, but they all need to leave. Like I don't want, mm-hmm. I don't want any of them on the floor because <laughs> they'll we probably need, all stay too. <laughs> we need new blood, man. We need new blood bad. Yeah. And so you look at the roster and what could happen and what could not happen. Like, is this going to be a down year next year? Uh, <clears throat> probably. But can everybody handle that? <laughs> is there a ceiling? Is there a ceiling? Do they do they get to twenty games? Do they win twenty games? Oh man, I'm gonna hit you with a comparison before we hop off here. Okay, my little outlook. I told somebody this is pertaining to the whole fire Rick crowd. All right, who's my favorite NBA team? The Portland Trail Blazers. Okay, so. I just told somebody this. It makes complete sense in my head. You can tell me if I'm delusional. So I look at firing him or keeping him sort of like the Dame-CJ combination. So it's almost like you know what you're going to get. So with those two guys together, you're going to get to the playoffs. You're probably never going to win anything beyond a second round game. They went to the Western Conference Finals once, I think, and then they ran into Golden State and they lost. But you you look I mean, me and you talk about them all the time. You look at the roster and it's just like it's just not gonna cut it. You know what you're gonna get, but that's all you're gonna get. Yeah. And they were together for so many years, and it's just like eventually if you want more you have to make a change as bad as it sucks. And you don't know that what you're going to get is any better than what you've got or how far they've already taken you. And it's the same situation, dude. It's like, if you get rid of him, if you fired this coach, it's the same thing. Like you don't know that anybody else can take you where he's already gotten you or where he's got you at right now. But that's why I told you I'm on the fence because it's like, if you already know that and you want more than that, it requires change. Mm-hmm. And it was like, as bad as it sucked watching that trade happen, it's just like, you know, it's never going to get any better. I mean, That's you might true. as well take a shot if you want something more than what you got. But I don't know, man. It's That's why I told you I'm on the fence. And I don't, I mean, I'm not a super crazy Tennessee fan. I, mean, I probably would keep him. But that's the comparison I made. And that's a good one. It's a really good one because it makes a lot of sense. It's just we've seen this for now eight years, and we now know, like, it's – the thing is, it's happened consistently. Like, we've got there. I mean, it's consistent, but then it's like, how long do you just want to be content with consistent? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, great take, bro. Well, Tennessee takes the L to FAU on last Thursday. 62-55, 62-55, and now we are in the offseason. Um, obviously, man, let's let's just ask this, man, as we finish up the Monday rundown. Who's winning the natty? That's got to be UConn. Bro, I, I mean, there's just no, there's no <laughs> way they're not winning. <clears throat> Good Lord. No way they're not winning, but I think UConn, too. I just I don't I don't I really don't think Texas can beat them. Like they're just too they're too long and they shoot the ball too well. They play both sides of the ball, dude. They're everything that Tennessee wished they were, man. They play great defense, but then they can turn around and score 80. quickly. Yeah, yep. I mean, you put eighty-two on Gonzaga, and they get they get out and run though. I mean, they're they got to have at least like a third of their points are probably transition. Have to. <laughs> they get out and run. 
man well y'all know what to do man like comment subscribe it's been the monday rundown thank you to aaron from stat chat sports i'm hopping on man talking all things basketball uh man we're gonna have this man on a lot more down the stretch uh really this summer man diving into a little bit of football who's gonna be the guy like i mean we don't uh, this man loves to bet he can help you with numbers over under who to take hey especially all your 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 line game parlays this guy's the man so <laughs> tennessee tennessee loses to fau again finishes the year 25 and 11 i can't believe they lost 11 games that's cool <laughs> anyways but thank y'all man for rocking with us you already know we'll be back wednesday for the midweek chat for my dude aaron and for my boy turn who was not with us today it's your boy rucking the building and it's straight up tennessee baby we'll see you on wednesday